Hello and welcome to One Parliamentary Language, a political podcast that was about a surprise to find out that the Evening Standard takes money to run favourable articles, as it was to find out that the Pope was Catholic. And I'm joined as always by my co-host Rob. How are you, Rob? I'm really, really well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. I am preparing for London Negroni Week next week um, with a Negroni. What's that? I don't know what that is. A Negroni is a very bitter cocktail. Ah, okay. And apparently next week it's London Negroni Week. It's, I, I learn something new every day. You know, I'm just counting down to the World Cup. You're having your whole weeks, you know. London, <laughs> London life and country life is, is so different. <laughs> and so straight on into headline quickfire. So our first one is from the Sunday Times. Leading Tory women revolt against May. So, yeah, this is the story that after the historic uh, referendum in Ireland happened at the weekend that repealed the Eighth Amendment, which effectively made it legal for women to have abortions in Ireland, um, that now the former Tories Women's and Equality Minister, and I think all of her predecessors, have now put pressure on Theresa May to uh, try and do the same in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is now the only place in the island of Ireland where you can't legally have an abortion. Um, it's unlikely to happen, and May has, I think May has already ruled out there being a referendum on the issue um, because she's sort of beholden on the DUP to keep her political power. Uh, but I think certainly after the historic result at the weekend, that it's not a question that's going to go away anytime soon. As you say, it was a very um, historic result. It's great to see that abortion is now uh, legalised again in Ireland. Um, there, there were some you know, stunning scenes. I mean, the, the vote was like 69%, 62%. It, it was... It was a strong majority, let's put it that way. Um, and there were women flying back from the from the UK to Ireland to make sure they could participate in the vote to give women a choice over what they can do with their own bodies. So it's good to see that has gone ahead. But yes, that leads us with Northern Ireland. And it's kind of a bit funny, I suppose. It kind of ties a bit into some of the stuff we've said about borders, where you know, if you're in Northern Ireland and you can just cross over to Ireland to have an abortion, it's kind of... It, it can't last long, right? Up against the fact that it will now be relatively relatively easy for people to kind of move across that border and, and, and get an abortion if they want one. Now, obviously, it's not as easy as it being on your doorstep, and that's the problem. But I can't believe it will hold up forever. I mean, obviously, with the DUP in power, I suppose it will last for a bit, but hopefully it will go away. Yeah, I, th I think a recent poll taken in Northern Ireland on the day after the, after the referendum result showed that they'd probably have a similar result yeah. in Northern Ireland if a referendum was held. Um, but it's it's a hold on yeah, sorry, carry on. So I was going to say, that, that's why they don't want to have a vote, right? <laughs> because they know they will lose. Yeah. Our next headline from The Independent. Immigrant, hero, citizen. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the story behind a viral video you might have seen of a man scaling a tower building to save a toddler um, who was about to fall. Um, this man was an illegal immigrant from Mali, uh, but he's now since been granted citizenship by President Macron. Um, sort of in response to his efforts, Macron even saying that he could go on to uh, be a firefighter um, because of his actions. And it was it's been a rare, well, it's been another sort of like good news story this week. Um, and in, in an age where Europe has been a bit wary of illegal immigrants and stuff like that, it, it's nice to have a feel good story for once about migration. Uh, I think it's one of these humanizing stories, right? It proves that people, people are inherently good uh, and anyone will have, you know, people will go out of their way to help people. And I, th I think, as you say, it's, it's like our fuzzy puppy update. It's a nice, it's a nice story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amidst all the, the normal horrible news we have to throw <laughs> <Yeah>. tapes through. <laughs> and now from the Metro, high speed rail for whole UK. Uh, yeah, this is the proposal from um, the group that's linked to HS2, which is the high speed rail line that's going to go from London to Manchester. I believe they've said that, um, by about 2040 or 2050, uh, these high-speed rail high-speed rail links could be extended throughout the country, going from places to Bristol and Glasgow, um, and this would be a good way of speeding up the economy and making us more competitive and put us on a par with the likes of France and Germany. Um, of course, the HS2 line itself has already been the subject of some controversy, with local residents not liking how the high-speed rail lines essentially have to go through their towns or villages or even the countryside and the disruption that might cause. Um, so it's something that, even though it might seem good for the economy, um, we yet to see, you know, if it does go ahead, what sort of effect it will have on those living in the countryside. 
you don't have to drive very far into the home counties to see anti-HS2 signs. It, it is definitely something that, while the average Londoner might not realise how much of a backlash there is, um, these communities that it's going through, where there's these kind of a, um, enforced purchase uh, laws being enacted so they can ensure that the train line will run a certain way, um, people there are not happy with these things being built on their land or what was their land until the government took it off them. So... Yeah, it's it can be a touchy subject, and considering HS two isn't even finished yet, I, I mean, I, I appreciate people need to start planning for things ahead of time, but I, I think it might be more of a political mixed bag for them than they think it will be. Our next story from the Financial Times: Italy crisis spreads as central bank chief warns investor trust is fading. So yeah, this is um, about the ongoing political crisis in Italy. So they had their election last month, I believe, or at the start of this month, um, but they've still yet to form a working coalition government. Um, because there was no outright winner, uh, you've got this weird mix between uh, the populist five-star movement, which are generally a little more left-wing, I think, but um, still have sort of like some anti-EU sentiment. Um, and they were said to, well, the, the plan was for them to pair up with the far right uh, Liga group and to try and form a new coalition government that might even look to take, might take Italy out of the European Union or at least put pressure on the European Union to change um, unless, uh, unless Italy gets uh, what they think they deserve. Um, the Italian economy since the, since the financial crash has really been stagnant and it's something that's worried Italian citizens, probably what led to this populist result in the first place. Uh, however, they've been unable to form a government. Uh, the prime minister that they appointed uh, resigned before a coalition government could even be put in place. Um, and all of this uncertainty usually breeds um, bad news on the currency market. So that's why someone like the Financial Times was reporting on this. Um, if the Italy crisis goes on for too long, um, if there's worry that the Italian economy might be dragged down because of it, it could start to affect other Eurozone countries. And if you lose faith in the Eurozone, that spreads to other European countries and you could see another downturn potentially. Yeah, and I think, I mean, people are probably on, pe concerns are, are heightened now with, with Brexit happening, that if another country were to go f for some kind of exit, the kind of problems that would happen and that, you know, that there is this wor worry. Um, I, I don't think it's massively likely but you know there is this worry about a kind of snowballing um a snowballing uh breakup of the eu as everyone decides oh we want to be on our own again yeah definitely um like italy was a founder member of the eu i don't see it leaving anytime soon but it's certainly like the most powerful member there to really put pressure on the european to change yeah and our next headline stop this brexit border madness from the daily express uh, yeah, this is sort of in response to what we were talking about last week, that uh, really nothing's changed. Nobody's made up their mind with how they want to uh, deal with the Northern Ireland border issue when it comes to Brexit. Uh, we mentioned that both uh, both of the options that are on the table, um, the customs option, the max fac, uh, are still being debated by the government, uh, and particularly with a paper like the Daily Express that's very uh, pro-Brexit, they sort of want to see a solution to this problem uh, sooner rather than later. It appears to be the one spanner in the works that's really holding up all other conversation and until it's sorted. And um, I can't remember if this was from a sub-headline from the same paper or where I saw it, but it was pointed out that Rhys Mogg says political will can solve the Northern Ireland border problem. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I see, I see a lot, having looked at these headlines, I see there's a lot of pro Rhys Mogg stuff coming out of them um, especially like the daily express well reese mogg is sort of the brexit cheerleader now he's, he's obviously a member of the conservative party but is out of cabinet so sort of the person who has the most freedom to speak about brexit uh, personally i i think what he's trying to what he's saying there is that both sides will have to come together to solve it so we will get a solution it's not going to be there uh, indefinitely um but he's trying to keep brexit here spirits up by sort of saying that you know, don't get disheartened, don't feel that it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, but it, it is a really sticky situation. We, we touched on it briefly last time. There's lots of history with the border and Northern Ireland. And it's a history that led to, you know, uh, troubles and a near civil war in the 1970s and 80s. So it, in my personal opinion, it will take more than mere political will to solve this Northern Ireland. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a tricky as we discussed last time, it is it's quite tricky to unpick. 
and just saying let's make it happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's not enough <laughs> yes <laughs> our next headline from the guardian i faked my own death to avoid kremlin hitman says journalist uh, yeah, this was an outstanding story, and it sort of caught the imagine of the front pages um, this morning uh, with other headlines I saw, like uh, You Only Live Twice coming out. It's like a modern-day sort of James bond this spy story. Um, essentially, a journalist who was a Russian dissident, he'd written on blogs how he was talking about uh, anti-Russian sentiment and saying how it was wrong for Russia to invade Ukraine. Um, he was reported, his death was reported on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, he surprised the world when he turned up at a news conference to say that he was alive and that he hadn't even told his wife about the sting operation uh, and that the whole thing was an attempt to make sure that he wasn't assassinated by Russian hitmen. Uh, it's quite an, you know, an outstanding story. I can't remember any time that something else like this has happened in the news. Um, I think Russia have since come out and said that we were never going to hit him. This is actually this is sort of an example of fake news or a pathetic stunt, um, I think was some of the words that they've said. Uh, but I, I think it really is an outstanding story and, and shows the lengths that people will have to go to escape what they see as a threat from the Russian state. We've already had the Salisbury poisoning that happened in the UK that was linked to Russia. Um, the more of these stories that come about, the bigger we feel maybe to threat Russia. And our final headline is from Over the Pond, which will lead us into our main topic. And it's from the New York Post. I mean, this... This this is frankly an amazing front page you've sent me, Rob. Um, I, th I think I'm going to have to re. I I'm going to set the scene. So, in the middle, smiling, the man himself, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, standing to his right, looking maybe a bit sheepish. Actually, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the expression is. He's clearly smiling as always, as he does for the cameras. She doesn't look like she's that happy to be there. Kim Kardashian. Um, and at the top of the paper under New York Post, it says, The Other Big Ass Summit. And then Kim Thong Un pitches prayers on prison reform. And the, the actual headline itself is Trump Meets Rump. Uh, it's, it's amazing. This will definitely be in the show notes. Uh, I can't believe this front page exists. But yeah, I mean, can you tell me more about Donald Trump meeting up with Kim Kardashian to discuss prison reform? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird thing. I, I woke up to this this morning, and as, as you can imagine, I was quite shocked. Um, I, as I, I heard a comment about this front page to be that they must have had a meeting and come up with came up with three headlines and decided to use them all on the front page. They thought they were all that good. Um, so, yeah, this is the big story of a washed up reality TV star meeting Kim Kardashian. Um, <laughs> Kim Kardashian met Trump to discuss a certain prison there's a story of a prisoner that came on who had been jailed since i think the mid 90s on a first time drug offense essentially trying to um tell the president that he should use his power of pardon to release this woman from prison uh, so that's why they met and that's the sort of small story behind this um but there's a lot of other things going on behind this picture like she's called kim thong un which relates to the fact that president trump has recently cancelled his meeting um with Kim Jong um, Un and some people said that it might be the only Kim he could actually arrange a meeting with. There was some confusion. The Evening Standard this evening had Trump meets other Kim. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's just kind of for the for the reality star president. This seems like one of the more bizarre meetings in the White House. Um, it's a real sort of clash of reality TV schedules. Um, and yeah, I just I just had to pick it. It was so it was so weird. I never thought that I would be talking to a political podcast about Donald Trump and Kim Kardashian to discuss prison reform. Very bizarre the age we live in. So I mean, yes, this is kind of strange, uh, as I said, but how does that kind of lead into Trump 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 as he is in like with home home policy and foreign policy? Yeah. So, I mean, it feels like recently with the whole step down over foreign policy, he's been kind of rattling his saber again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were all quite happy when, when it looked like there was going to be a summit in North Korea, and now it looks like it's not happening. Um, and then the kind of, I mean, not being American, this seems like much more of a publicity stunt than it is actually doing anything good policy-wise. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it, it, I, I wanted to try and move on to the, the subject that I want to talk tonight. It's, it's kind of an example of how Trump has been relatively powerful 
abroad in his foreign policy and relatively sort of like weak or insubstantial in home policy. Um, if he's meeting somebody like Kim Kardashian to just discuss prison reform, although it's a good front page and a funny front page, it doesn't really suggest that he's been doing much sort of serious political actions at home, like working with the Senate or working with other people. Um, so I wanted to try and discuss why that was tonight, just sort of like work through a little bit of how the US government works, what the situation's like, how it's a bit different to the UK. And so you can see the, sort of the differences between Trump, the American president, and Trump, the global leader. Yeah, so I mean, I suppose moving on from that, um, I know a bit about US politics. I, I don't know what our listeners know. So what is the current situation um, for Trump at home. I mean, I thought he was in quite a strong position because he, I mean, he's president, obviously, but also don't they have control of both the, the Republicans have control of both the House of Representatives and the Senate? Yeah, exactly. And the whole point is that Trump is in a massive position of power that he should be using far better than he is. Um, so as you said, that there's he has control of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, so that's the legislature. So the example for the UK politics would be parliament. Yeah, in the UK, um, the executive and the legislature are together. So Theresa May is an MP, but she's also the prime minister. In the USA, the roles are split. So Donald Trump is the president, uh, but he doesn't really control as much as he'd like the Senate and the House. And the way a bill moves through the US Senate is it must be proposed by a member of the House or the Senate, and then it must get approved by both houses, and then the president gets to put his rubber stamp of approval. Usually in US politics, the houses are split. So you might have a Democratic uh, House, but a Republican Senate. Um, or you might even get a situation where towards the end of Obama's presidency, he was what they would refer to as a lame duck president. So he didn't have control of either house. Uh, so all the bills that were coming to him would have been approved by Republican House and Senate, and then he'd have to decide whether he approved them or not, which is a very weak position to be in. So so Trump should be in a very, very strong position and should be able to get his agenda through. Um, but as you may have noticed on a few big things like immigration and, and healthcare, he's really failed in that aspect. I mean, yeah, I mean, there have been several large votes, haven't there? Um, that, I mean, they filtered over to here, or I may, I may have seen a few of them when I was over in America, but the majority of those stories, I feel, have filtered over to here, at least via sources like Reddit and, and on you know the, the, the news. That So he was trying to reform Obamacare, essentially, and that did that go th- failed twice before they got something through, I think? Yeah, well, it's failed. It's failed twice, and they haven't... The thing that they've come up with is more... Uh, it's more economic than an actual reform or repeal that he wants to do. Mm. Um, so the, the Medicare one is the best example of how Trump's been able to sort of like ruin, it has been able to not capitalise on the advantage of having control of both the House and the Senate. So the medicine bill is proposed by Trump. Trump says, I want to repeal Obamacare. And then the House leader and the Senate leader say, OK, Trump, tell us what actually the details of this should be so I can get it approved by the people I've got to go and have a vote with. And Trump gave them very little detail about what to include in that bill. So they have to go off to their respective houses, draw up a bill and get it approved by both. Um, So imagine the equivalent in the UK is getting a vote passed in the House of Commons and then passed in the House of Lords. The tricky thing is that the bill must be exactly the same that passes through both. And usually there are different coalitions of Republicans and Democrats each house that means that it's slightly harder to have the same bill go through. So the best way to describe it is there's a very there's a very conservative Tea Party faction in the House of Representatives, and they wanted the they wanted the Medicare bill to be really strong and really repeal a lot. Um, however, in the Senate, the members in there are far more sort of conciliatory and want to make sure that the bill didn't hurt as many people or was more middle of the road. So even there, you can see there's a problem within the Republican Party getting the same bill through. The way you usually solve this, if you're a president, is that you're meant to bring both sides together or you bring a you push a middling bill through both houses. So you're able to persuade Democrats who might be slightly more right leaning or might be more willing to compromise to support your bill to help it go through. Do you mean do you mean Democrats who are more left leaning? Uh, no, so, oh, so sorry, Demo- sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I get what you mean now. Sorry, I've derailed you. Yeah, 
no, no, that's all right. They're, they're called like, um, I think they're called like red dog Democrats or whatever. They're, they might be Democratic senators who are in a slightly Republican leaning state. So therefore, they are slightly more conservative on some issues. Um, they'll get a handful of those to basically support a Republican bill. And that goes through. Uh, what President Trump has been really poor at is persuading the two parties to work together. He's been so divisive, and I think that I think that's just that's clear um, from polling as well that he's one of the most unpopular presidents this far into his term with the general public. Um, I think most Democrats would see it as electoral suicide to vote along a Trump proposed bill that many of them just don't want to cross the floor to vote on the same things as their Republican counterparts, and that has led to this sort of legislative gridlock within the House and the Senate. And to make it even worse for Trump, he can't even keep unity in his own party. He has a majority in the Senate, but you've got senators like John McCain, for example, who tend to vote against the high profile Trump ones. So it's kind of it's Trump's inability to compromise and inability to get the consensus politics through, which is what the whole US political system was sort of designed to do. The whole system of checks and balances was designed to have middling and moderate policies go through. And that's just not how Trump does things. Is it true to say he, I mean, how big is his majority? Is it quite small? So how, how many uh, Republican senators have to rebel against him before it's a problem? Uh, it's, it only takes two or three to rebel against him. He's got, did set out with a 52 48 majority that's now slipped 51 to 49 because the republic lost one i think in alabama um i don't remember if you remember that but that was doug jones democrat one out of nowhere against roy Moore. oh yes yeah i heard about that yeah um who was quite a controversial republican himself uh so they only need a majority and even if one rebelled currently then the tie can be broken by the vote of the vice president so in which case mike pence is usually but he's nearly always in a vote for what president trump wants um but because you only need one or two and the republican party is quite a broad church uh, got people who are sort of more on the libertarian side like uh, a ron paul who vote against any bill that didn't cut taxes dramatically and it, it only takes sort of like one or two people to disagree to highly derail any policy platform that trump has so Presumably also Trump doesn't have this power for very long because don't we have the midterm elections happening this year? Yeah. Um, so the midterm elections should happen in the midterm elections will happen in November of this year. Uh, the prediction is that the Democrats will probably win the House. Um, so all the states in the House, sorry, all the seats in the House of Representatives are elected every two years. So that's sort of the most volatile change. Uh, and it's with current national polling going the way it is, it's predicted that the Democrats will win the House of Representatives. Senate is slightly different. So senators have a six-year term, and a third of the Senate is voted in every midterm election every two years. And of the third of seats that are up for grabs this time round, a lot are in very strong remaining districts anyway. Um, so there is a sort of doubt that even though it's so close, that 51 to 49, there's not that many opportunity for Democrats to have a senator win in a winnable seat, for example. It's it's a little like, if I can make a comparison with the UK election, um, we've just had UK council elections. They didn't happen nationally. They happened across the country and they tended to be in seats that Labour already held. So it was sort of like, it was harder for Labour to make loads of gains on that night because they were already in Labour held. The Democrats sort of faced the opposite problem of the Republicans are having an election where lots of very strongly held Republican seats and super hard for them to make an indent into that in the midterm. So we may see a situation where President Trump faced with at least one House actively working against his policy platform. And then he'll find putting controversial measures through even more difficult. So he's, he's already sort of wasted his opportunity to get his big forms through on immigration and health care. The only one he really managed was, was tax. But that's a very traditional conservative idea anyway. It wasn't that that wasn't that revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we kind of expect the Republicans to try and cut taxes, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It should be the one thing that they agree on. And they did. They came together for that one. But for everything else, it's been a lot harder to build a consensus. And that's what Trump's himself to be really bad at doing. So on the flip side, why is he so powerful in foreign policy? Does the executive branch and therefore him have, have more power in, in military decisions, more foreign policy decisions? Or is it just um, is it just that because of his position as a figurehead, he can say things that carry weight internationally? Yeah, it's 
it, it's sort of half and half. It's it's a little from column A, a little from column B. So uh, President Trump is is the executive. He's the commander in chief, which makes him the leader of uh, armed forces. Although President Trump really hasn't hasn't done any military action. He hasn't invaded a country. He hasn't done what George W. Bush did, for example. Um, he still has a lot of power when it comes to military matters when how to do strikes. So, for example, the strikes that happened against Syria that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, that would have happened just because President Trump said so and the military agreed. Um, also, as part of his informal power as sort of a figurehead, a, a, a head of state, it's his job to talk to other countries and negotiate those deals um, with other countries. The only place where Congress really has a say in these things to ratify any treaties. Um, Trump hasn't made any treaties yet. If, if anything, he's put to break them. So the one treaty that they had with Iran, um, that was a treaty that was first brought up, that was first brought up under Obama. Uh, and the Senate made Obama have to keep approving that treaty about every year or every six months just to keep it rolling. And it's designed by a Republican Senate to sort of embarrass Obama was the idea that I would have to keep bringing it up. Um, unfortunately, they didn't see that they'd have <laughs> Trump, a president who was so vehemently against it. It sort of was embarrassing for President Trump inadvertently every time he had to keep saying that it was OK because he really didn't like the deal. and He campaigned on it. So eventually his his patience with the deal snapped. Um, he saw a way out. And now we're in a situation where Iran doesn't have to abide by that. They could start making nuclear weapons again, albeit under sanctions. So the other thing is where Trump's got a lot of power in something like relocating the Jewish embassy to uh, to Jerusalem. That was a foreign policy decision that needed no approval progress just from people in Trump's cabinet. And Trump has most power over picking who he wants to work with his cabinet to be ratified to any great extent by the Senate. Once that's done, you you, you saw the protest that happened that last week. It had a massive international impact, yet that's a decision of, of one man. Mm. Yeah, finally in Korea, Trump is personally powerful. He is. Um, all it took was one letter to potentially derail or at least move the goalposts of Korean peace process. Even though moves are now being made to get that summit back on track, it seems to be that Trump is dictating those terms. So it just shows how much power one man can have, and it's unchecked. There's nothing really, at this stage at least, that the Senate or Supreme Court can do to, to put a check on Trump's power to stop him. So I, I, appreciate, I appreciate, you know, that people will look to him as the voice of his nation um, in the same way people do with all foreign leaders. So I appreciate there's, there's some inherent power in the words of a, of, a, of a leader of a nation. But why is he allowed to... Basically, why is he allowed to get away with this? Why are there less checks and balances on what he says in this kind of field? Essentially, it's because um, rules of what a president can and can't do are dictated by the Constitution. It's open to interpretation. Mm. And I think when it was invented over 250 years ago, few could have imagined how powerful the USA would become on the global stage. Importantly, how divided the nation might be on how it should run its foreign policy. I think 250 years ago, it was quite clear that, boo, British bad, we want independence, we want to go and do our own thing. Uh, that's a very simplistic view of American history, I apologise. Um, For more information, but... see how <laughs> the musical. <laughs> yes. Um, but everybody sort of imagined that the president would just work for the common good. Um, Trump isn't a conventional president, and there's no sort of official rule stopping the president from doing what he's doing and exercising power. Um, the way that this has been summarised by some commentators, I saw this briefly doing my research for this scene, had said that foreign policy was Trump's stress ball and was a chance to sort of flex his muscles and, and show Congress and the rest of the world just how powerful he is. And mm. it's usually as a response for him feeling sort of like relatively weak and powerless in his own country to affect change. Um, foreign policy, these big grand gestures are the only way that Trump has really been able to show the power of its presidency. And it's when he's when he's been unchecked. Uh, that might be why some people find the Trump presidency so dangerous. Uh, foreign policy is basically at his whim and mm. there's very little that Congress can do to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah like, now we're on a downer. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry for that. Like, <laughs> there is, it's not all doom, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, you know, I don't think certainly if Trump suddenly decided to launch World War Three, I think you'd see a lot more things going on. Yeah. Speak up. 
as far as likely, but just these relatively minor decisions, something like moving the moving of the Israeli embassy is again, I'm sorry for going over the point, but it's something that seems relatively small. There was a big reason why he didn't do that in the past. And when he made it, you saw the visceral reaction it had and yeah. the potential derailing of the whole Middle East peace process that had been running for years and years before that because yeah. of the, the whim of a man. And the fact that, you know, as you say, if he's using it as a stress ball, that kind of out of spite, he can end up doing something that you yeah it might seem like a minor thing he has control over to him and make him feel good but then it has knock-on consequences that no one's happy about yeah and, and this is him in charge this is him with a republican senate and house in charge if he loses both houses in the midterms then it would be very interesting if he changes how he runs his policy when he's getting democratic bills but will he act out more essentially is what we're yes. saying For all of you listening to this podcast on your Android device, do us a favour and give the Podcast Republic app a try. If you've been listening on the website up until now, this app will allow you to get all of your favourite podcasts directly on your Android device. You can then search for the podcasts you want to listen to, select them as your favourite, and have them all just a click away. One of the best features, as far as I'm concerned, is the ability to modify podcast details locally, allowing you to customise the look and feel on your device or rename them for better organisation. Don't forget to set on parliamentary language as a favourite so that you don't miss any new episodes from the front benches on the Podcast Republic app. And now for a quick polls update. So how have the polls moved this t- this week, Rob? The big news is they haven't really moved. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're still getting the we're still getting the old story that's it might be a reflection, as I said last week, that we haven't really uh, had any big scandal issue since the local council elections. One thing that may start to move them slightly, we didn't mention it in our heads, uh, saw it on the BBC today, the Muslim Council of Britain has essentially accused the Conservative of Islamophobia. Did you hear that this morning? I, that hasn't filtered through to me. No, I must have missed that. Um, if you get a chance to read the letter, it's well worth it. It's, it's very persuasive. It's got lots of bullet points of examples of Conservative councillors and sort of ministers saying the same, the same things that got Labour councillors in trouble when they had the accusations of Semitism. So I'll, I'd like to see that these polls are always on a slight lag and that would have been apparent till today. Um, yeah. So I'd like to see how things have changed uh, when that news filters through in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that is, it will be interesting to see if it has as big an effect because I, I would guess that, I, I don't have any numbers in front of me, but I would guess that we have a probably at least equivalent populations, if not a larger Muslim population to Jewish population in the UK. Um, I, I don't I don't know if that's correct. That's my initial assumption. I, I'll just quickly Google that, actually. I think what, while you're Googling that, the one thing where it might have a slightly less of an impact is that the anti-Semitism claims that are being brought up are being brought up mainly in a right-leaning press by newspapers that were supportive of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. The reason why that news may not have filtered through to you this morning in Council of Britain's letter is because it just wasn't on the front pages as much. We'll need to see if it if it gains traction like the other story in the papers. I hope it does, because you'd like to think we've got fair and unbalanced press and both of these issues can be addressed and hopefully resolved. So with a quick Wikipedia, um, the UK has a Jewish population of 370,000, but it has a population of three point, well, just just over three million Muslims. You, you would expect if there are more people who have been um who are seeing these stories that then that the effect on the polls should be greater um but well that remains to be seen right yeah essentially we, we've got to wait until this this story filters through and see if it does have an effect on the and the question i suppose is is as, as you say it's a question of how, how much of an effect the press has but also how vocal are those two groups um yeah uh, yeah I, I i honestly have no idea if it's simply pa- a power in numbers argument or if 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 you know how the political parties and and how the papers see see the the you know that the muslim council and um the jewish council I don't, I don't know how they react to those things um it'll be interesting to see if it's as big of a swing towards labor as, as labor had against earlier if you know there's a lot of moving factors here <laughs> so you would expect it to swing more towards labor but by how much yeah the the, the other factor that is sort of involved is it might not really move the late la- lead of needle for labor because the people who are voting conservative as affected by the fact that it they might be islamophobic right do you get do you get what i mean so it's 
it's a bigger effect if the Conservatives were certain pensioners, because yeah. pensioners are a core part of the Conservatives' vote. Yeah. Um, but if the Conservatives started slacking off young people, then it's a less core part, and the needle might not move, even though, because because young people vote Labour. Yes, yeah. Anyway, so it doesn't have an effect, even if it's a big scandal. Sorry, it's hard, hard to generalise an entire religion, but um, you can see the demographic spread is mostly London, Birmingham, Manchester kind of areas. So they're already generally Labour areas. Um, yeah. So, so I think that probably does line up with your your assumption there. So, yeah, an an anti-Muslim uh, feeling in the Labour Party would have more of a negative effect on Labour than this yes. might have on the Conservatives. But we yeah, will see. So. We will keep our eyes on the polls. So for that. And now for our returning regular feature, would you rather? So, what questions do you have for me this week, Rob? Okay. So we've had quite a few uh, important referendums recently. Brexit memorably and recently on killing the eighth amendment island and i wanted to ask you if you think that referendums are a good way of conducting democracy uh, or if you'd like to see them sort of ruled out altogether so i th- i think it's like with all these things it's not really as binary a choice uh, as the question may make it sound so it's, it's are we talking about referendum it's only a binary choice <laughs> Well, this is what I mean. So, so the pro- the problem we have stated several times that happened with the Brexit referendum was that it was made a binding referendum, uh, essentially by how people acted. So, um, I can't remember what the exact terms were in the referendum, um, but I think it was it, well, there was some kind of clause saying like we would enact the will of the people or something. I can't remember the exact terminology, <laughs> but that's that's essentially how it's panned out. Um, so I, I think that the idea of using a referendum as a barometer for public feeling is not something I'm against. Mm-hmm. But the idea of using a referendum entirely to decide something when we already have elected representatives is a much muddier thing. Um, and we have example. I mean, so we have we've picked a good example and a bad example, essentially, as far as I'm concerned. I'm yeah. happy that I'm happy that the Eighth Amendment has been repealed in Ireland, and I'm not happy about Brexit. So but, how but are is they? That, sorry. Hmm? Is, is that because of the result of those referenda, or is it because of the way in which they were conducted? Uh, that, that's what. So what I'm saying is, I'm I'm happy with both the result of the Ireland referendum. And I'm not happy with the result of the Brexit referendum. So then we have to look at how they were both run. Now, obviously, I've not seen as much of the Irish referendum as as I did Brexit. Um, I, I don't know how long they were campaigning for, but I've only really seen the build up in the last few weeks. Um, I've seen a few posts from friends on Facebook prior to that, but I was. It wasn't something that was directly affecting me, so it's something I've only really picked up on recently, whereas Brexit we were talking about for over a year, I think. You know, it was... Owen was still talking about it, but (laughs) it was a very big deal in the UK. Um, I think think I've said multiple times on various podcasts at this point that the thing I don't like about the Brexit... that I didn't like about the Brexit referendum was the idea that it was like a 50-50. I feel that... If if you're going to have a binding vote of any kind, then I think having a 50-50 on a referendum is just too close because th- th- that would be indicative of no real change, but there is some concern here to me, as opposed to we should do a very big change. Um, so I, I feel like with, with the Ireland referendum, you can look at it and you can go, well, it was nearly, it, it was sorry, it was like two thirds to a third. That 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 feels like a solid result. Whereas... 52 to 48% doesn't feel like a solid result. So if if the Irish government now said, well, you've given us this referendum and we're going to ignore the result, people would be justifiably angry at that. I'm not, I'm not saying that people who, who would, wouldn't be angry if Brexit had not gone ahead based on the referendum, but that you can see when it's a very close vote that there is a cause for caution. And to be like doing something that only just over half of the people want and arguably, if you look at how the stats work out, less than half the people want um, based on a, on a referendum vote, vote is a bad idea. And I also think you have to probably take into account turnout. So Brexit actually had quite a good turnout as uh, uh, votes go. I can't remember how it compares to the general election off the top of my head, but I think it's kind of, it was kind of comparable, right? 35%? Uh, sorry, the turnout, I think it was... in the turnout in the referendum, the Brexit referendum, was, was more than the general election. Okay, so, so, so I mean, so at least that shows it is a representative sample of of people who can vote the voting electorate um so 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 that you know at least i'm okay with but i, th- I think the problem stems with like re- referendums i think you need to be more careful in setting them up than you are with with other things i mean 
with a general election, it's very clear you have your choice between your local MP for all the various parties. And while I may disagree, think that first past the post is not the best system, as we've touched on previously, in general, like, I, 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 you know, it makes sense that there is, it makes sense when you go, the person with the most votes wins in that situation. Like, I, th- I think people understand what's going on there, even yeah. if first past the post may not be the best system to get the most representative candidate. Overall, it kind of shakes out to the point that we've stuck with that system for a long time because it kind of works. Whereas I feel with the, the referendums, we've not done many of them. And um, yeah, as, as I say, they've been, I think you need to take more care in drawing them up. And I think a big problem was with the Brexit one was we kind of went, oh, there's no way we're going to lose. Um, so we didn't bother to put in some kind of it has to be like a two thirds majority. Um, yeah. And I think that is the kind of thing you need to be careful about. I think the idea of having referendums on everything is a bit silly. Um, I think that's taking it too far. Um, I know there are some, uh, there's an episode of How Many Things on Transhumanism coming out where I think we mention um, that in the culture series of books, this is a, a post, post-human, post-scarcity society where they basically have a referendum on everything and vote from their wrists, you know, or, or by just, you know, going to a lo- local computer and just vote and say have a referendum all the time. But that's very different to the kind of world we live in. You know, you know we have to have a fair amount of debate on what's going to happen. And, and I think referendums should definitely be used sparingly. And I worry now that I'm sounding a bit like a politician kind of talking around the subject. <laughs> but I think I probably haven't made a firm and hard decision. I think I think there is a place for referendums, but I think mostly they should be limited to a poll of what the electorate thinks if the current government doesn't think they can make a reasonable conclusion. Yeah. Because the whole point is we have voted them into power to make these decisions on our behalf. And in general, I feel that's how representative democracy should work. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure if I've actually come to a conclusion here really but i think i think in general i think they're they're probably being used in the wrong way and we should hold back on them for a while i i I agree i I agree with many of your points agree with the most is that particularly on a big constitutional issue like brexit was that the 50 50 was sort of the worst result as possible um that it does it doesn't feel like there's a great will within the country to leave the european union with a 52 to 48 split compare it to the Irish referendum, very, very clear will expressed there. Also, the Brexit referendum is a bit weird in the fact that it was, that it had to be enacted by a government that didn't really support it at the time. You know, like MPs don't really support it. Um, it, it was called without, there was no, um, the result of both, the result of one of the sort of options in the Brexit referendum was clear. So compare it to the Irish referendum, to keep the eighth amendment, it's repealed. And it was very clear what would happen if it Appeal, abortions would be allowed. With Brexit, it was clear that we were going to leave the union, but how it was going to happen, what that involved, the government didn't even draw up a white paper or anything that said, here's our proposal for leaving the European Union if it goes through. So we didn't so a lot of people voted on a voted on a Brexit that they're probably never going to be able to achieve, if you get what I mean. There's nothing the government doesn't even know what they want for Brexit yet. So yeah, my, my criteria for sort of the same as yours sort of a two-thirds majority only on big constitutional issues. I guess my only amendment to it would be that we actually have a very clear idea of both responses entail. Yeah, so essentially you're saying that you know, referendums need to have very clear choice between two very obvious things, and if they go if they go through, the go- you need a government that would be willing to enact that. So, yeah, I mean... Or at least have a, pla- at least have a plan to... We'd, we've joked sometimes that we haven't had a plan on Brexit. Um, yeah, w- without that plan, without us going in with both eyes open about what consequence both our decisions would be, it, it led to a worse referendum campaign because of it, because the campaign on the side was vaguer. They yeah. could promise more. Yeah, uh, it was very fuzzy as to what voting to leave meant. So as with all these things, you can you can put your own spin on it in your head when you're when you're going to vote for it. We don't know if if that Brexit vote of fifty percent wanting to leave, if it was if that could be split into five factions of ten percent thinking very different things. Precisely. A whole spectrum can be represented in that we just want to leave. If it's not a clear we will leave in this way. Whereas leave the law as it is, repeal the law is very clear. That there's yes. any Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I I think I agree with all your points there. Um You've probably put it more concisely than I have. So, so thank you for joining us on Unparliamentary Language. As always, you can find us on Twitter at Unparl Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Reddit forward slash Unparliamentary. And you can find us at our new, new shiny URL of parliamentary.observer, which will take you to uh, the normal website that you're used to seeing. 
on tinkertailorsoldspunge.com. And finally, you can go and, uh, if you want to support us and help Rob buy a better microphone, um, go to patreon.com forward slash TTSS. And it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from him. Bye. Bye. So wrap up, wrap up, wrap up. How do I normally start a wrap up? Wrap, wrap. Massive. Uh, Rob's, Rob's down with the kids. Uptake. Uh, yeah, outtake. it's it's lit, fam. It's well. <laughs>